uh, and thank you very much for the for the introduction and the invitation to be here on my my first visit to Karachi. Um, I'm always very very glad to uh, to come to Pakistan. It's a place which has many fond memories for me. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to uh, discuss here um, some of the experiences that, that businesses that I work with in different parts of the world have uh, have made on implementing water stewardship and uh, developing the, the concept further. I'll, get, I'll start off just by giving a bit of a background on um, you know, where this water stewardship thinking is coming from, uh, some of the drivers behind it. I'll, uh, I'll touch on the, how that's been formulated in the AWS standard, the Alliance for Water Stewardship standard. And then I'll give you some examples on where that standard has been used, some of the benefits it's reaped, but also some of the challenges that are, that are existing. But first, um, as you would expect from most presentations, you've got to start with a who we are slide. Uh, but I would argue for us at AWS, the who we are is particularly important because AWS stands for the Alliance for Water Stewardship, and that alliance is represented here in this slide. These are our members. It's a little bit distorted, isn't it? I'm not sure Ronald McDonald would thank me for the uh, for the shape of his of, of his arches there, but um, these are the organizations which comprise the alliance, or most of them, it's not completely up to date. And I've pointed out as a vegetarian, the uh, McDonald's here in the middle, uh, Nestle of course, Coca-Cola, big companies, a lot of food and beverage representation there. Uh, but it's not just about the big companies, it's also about the, uh, the NGOs, WWF as we've been hearing has been very much a part of AWS from the beginning. But it's also smaller NGOs, uh, like, for example, one which isn't represented here from Pakistan, um, Reed, Bangla, uh, 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 Pakistan, which is a, a, a small, a relatively small non-profit here in Pakistan, which has joined AWS and contributes really valuable experience to this community uh, from a very specific angle of rural development here in Pakistan. It's really important learning for us that we wouldn't get necessarily from a major corporation. And the public sector is, is also a key part. Uh, um, some of the public sector members we have include economic development uh, agencies, even the health service in my native Scotland uh, has joined seeing the benefits of water stewardship for their sustainability objectives. So. The point I'm making here, though, is, is water stewardship is fundamentally what we term a multi-stakeholder approach. It, uh, it requires input from big and small, from public and private, and from civil society, and from across all regions. In order to address some of the problems which probably don't need reiterating here, but from a public policy perspective, you know, this is one depiction, one set of statistics that that can try and capture some of the challenges around water, uh, the, the number of people affected, the number of people living in water stressed areas, uh, how that demand is going to, going to increase, what it's going to mean for our economies, our, our communities going forward. Or from a, a different perspective, this is a recently produced report from the OECD, which, uh, which looks at water risk hotspots particularly looking at agricultural areas and, and very much looking at, okay, where are, the, where are the future risks coming from? It doesn't show up particularly well here because it's just highlighted country by country, but if you zone into these areas, um, it certainly you get some pretty scary statistics. And for example, uh, Indian, Indian Punjab, uh, North uh, East, China, this bit, this east, isn't it? Uh, California and other places. Um, again, getting the public sector, the uh, policymakers, heads around where they need to be need, need to be thinking in terms of policy going forward. But it also matters to you and me. Every day we hear uh, news on uh, in the newspapers and the media and the internet about 
water related issues here from California, big signs about droughts, getting into the public consciousness, raising community, community tensions in some areas, um, issues around water quality. Uh, this is a clipping from Bangladesh, for example. This picture of a, of a, of a supposed waterway could, could be taken virtually anywhere in, 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 uh, in Asia, really. Um, such as the municipal, uh, the, the, the inadequacy of uh, infrastructure to cope with rising populations. And it's not just in developing countries, it's also in developed countries. This from, from the US, the city of Flint, which attracted international media attention around the, the poisoning of the, of the municipal water supply there. So it's getting into our own lives every day. And when that happens, then businesses start to sit up and take notice because it manifests itself in risk for businesses. Physical risk, too much, too little water. Is it going to be there next, next year when I need it? Reputational risk, what are consumers, what are investors, what are communities, governments, what are they thinking about my business activities? And how is that manifesting itself in the regulatory landscape. You may recall a few years ago from Thailand when there was some slow onset flooding. It wasn't a surprise, it wasn't a sudden sudden event, but it was very much a, a gradual event due to prolonged periods of rain that led to enormous problems through supply chains around the world. This from car production um, and, and affecting computer uh, hard, uh, hardware supplies, etc. And when, when you start to put some numbers to that, you can see that it gets pretty scary pretty quickly. And when you start talking about numbers and billions of dollars, that's when investors start to take notice. Like here, the, the World Economic Forum producing a global risk report every year, which points water each year in a slightly different position, but always pretty high up there in terms of risk, likelihood, and potential impact. And that springs from different reports as well, targeting specifically investors, aiming to get them to do more to encourage their clients to perform better on water. So that's where this water stewardship initiative, this business engagement in water stewardship is coming from. And so we've defined water stewardship, as you can see here. We've taken into account what water stewardship should achieve in terms of social, economic, environmental outcomes to address some of the issues I've highlighted before, but importantly, how they're achieved. They're achieved through inclusive processes. It's what we do together that matters and where we do it. We don't do it just within our own site, within our own property. We work together in the context of a catchment. And that's really critical to understand the, the nature of water stewardship. Every uh, factory in, in, uh, in Pakistan operating perfectly would not result in a, perfectly, uh, uh, a perfect water system for Pakistan because there are many other users beyond industry who rely on the same resort who would be creating risk for those businesses as well. So it's imperative that we look at this in a collective way. It's imperative that we look at water stewardship not just as water, I beg your pardon, not just as an, as an input to be managed, but as an asset that is shared, one that creates value for a variety of different users in a variety of different ways. So why, why then go down the route of a water stewardship standard? Well, voluntary standards have been shown to be very effective in engaging the private sector in driving transparency, in driving collaboration, and improving sustainability performance. And voluntary standards enable businesses to go beyond the minimum requirements for legal compliance and move towards best practice, provides market-based incentives to move towards best practice, to innovate, to bridge that gap between what regulation is, is stipulating, even when it's perfectly informed, and, and what sustainability 
is actually a requirement. So here's a snapshot of, of our response to this. <clears throat> We've produced a standard that's developed in around six steps of implementation. It requires an, an, a commitment. It requires gathering and understanding data relating to your context. It requires using that to make a plan which is implemented, evaluated, and communicated. And this is all in relation to a water using site. It focuses in on the water user themselves. And in do implementing that plan, that site should achieve these four outcomes. There's a quantitative outcome, a qualitative outcome, a values-based outcome, and a governance-based outcome. And these outcomes simply reflect the concerns that stakeholders voice to us during a four-year global standard development process that included representation from all sectors and all regions. Our system also includes independent third-party certification so that you can make credible claims of meeting best practice. There's many stories told about water stewardship performance, but unless it's independently verified against a stakeholder-endorsed standard, who knows what they really mean? Of course, you may be wondering, as many do, uh, this is all very well, uh, but it's different here. And that's the whole point. It's different everywhere. The standard is, is one single standard for all sectors and all regions, and so clearly it doesn't stipulate the precise nature of actions you need to take. Rather, it provides you a framework to understand your context, to uh, develop transparent processes, uh, to understand stakeholder needs and understand their own risks and opportunities in order to deliver on those four outcomes I mentioned before. Sustainable water balance, good water quality, uh, the, the values and water governance. But it leaves this space in the middle free for any site and anywhere to take actions that are suitable for that location. That's what's encapsulated in your site water stewardship strategy and plan. And this is to just give you a snapshot of, of where the standard is being used in terms of certification. The yellow dots represent sites who are seeking certification, and the red dots represent sites which have achieved certification. And we're at very early stages. This system has been live for about two years. Uh, and so we're, we're really at a very early stages. But you can see it's been widely uptaken uh, in various parts of the world. And the astute amongst you may also recognize a correlation between the darker areas in the previous map I showed on water risk and where these dots are most tightly um, collected. And that is because where water risk is, is most uh, acute it makes more sense to invest in implementing the AWS standard. And you can see here there's quite a, a cluster developing here over in Pakistan. And here is that cluster in more detail. Well, uh, this is Nestle uh, Shekapura facility, uh, which has a red dot, uh, which means that it has become the first site in uh, South Asia to achieve AWS certification. So that would happened earlier this year in May. So uh, it's not too late to say congratulations uh, to, uh, to Attica and, and her team for, for that really tremendous achievement, um, which has stimulated um, the other Nestle sites here in Pakistan to also seek certification, Islamabad, Kabirwala and Port Kazim. Akroma, Pakistan and Jonshiro is also seeking certification. The Lahore Citywide Partnership is also utilizing elements of the AWS standard to, uh, to achieve its aims. And we have here the 
so-called WAPRO project. This is a project which deals with cotton and rice in three countries, uh, four countries, I beg your pardon, India, Pakistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. And again, uses the AWS standard to help drive uh, more water productivity in these very thirsty crops. This has also stimulated the establishment of the Pakistan Water Stewardship Network, which is absolutely critical because water stewardship happens in a place. It's, it, it's a location-based effort. My job is to, is to manage an international system and the international processes behind that system. But we need information. We need that system to reflect the real needs. And I can't figure all that out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy, but I can't figure it all out from my, from my office in Scotland. I need the information to come from the field, to come from implementation, to understand what the perspectives from, from industry in Pakistan are, in the same way as I need to understand the perspectives of agriculture in Peru and put that into the multi-stakeholder forum of AWS to create that framework, which is continually responding to needs as they emerge and knowledge as it's generated. So, um, just to give you a couple of examples, I'll just zip through these quickly, I won't dwell on them too long, uh, just to give you a bit of a sense on, uh, on how things are um, shaping up in other countries. And Atika, I think, is going to talk to you a bit more detail about the specific case of Shikapura. Um, one of the interesting uh, approaches we're adopting in China is working with industrial parks. Um, and the reason why we're doing that is because where you have uh, uh, locations in which we have multiple entities essentially doing the same or very similar things, you have real opportunity to to A, bring SMEs into the picture, and B, to, um, to uh, sort of achieve more economies of scale than you would just going company by company by company. And so we've been working with uh, both municipalities and industrial parks, uh, municipality in Kunshan and the Teda Industrial Park with more than a thousand SMEs present. Um, and this is to complement the sort of push factors of, and, and, and in China, they, those pushes are quite firm pushes as well, in terms of, of you know, re reducing discharge, improving water quality, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's fines, there's, there's, and they're pretty severely imp implemented. It wouldn't be unusual for companies to be shut down if they're not uh, in compliance with uh, what is determined here. But to combine that with the pull factors, um, and, to, and for us not just to be pre pre presenting the standard as a standalone initiative, but for it to be incorporated into some of the other uh, incentives for companies to improve their performance, whether that's through uh, you know, uh, credit ratings, trading schemes, um, subsidies, uh, and for us really to be, to be seeing this as, as incorporated into a, a broader approach that, that captures uh, a number of different initiatives under one umbrella. And some of the it's early, early stages, but some of the learnings we're seeing there is that the need for very specific sector guidance in, in areas like that. That's where, to replicate something like this in Pakistan, for instance, that's where the Pakistan Water Stewardship Network would come in really handy to lead the development of that, that guidance material. Um, needing to strengthen the capacity of the industrial, uh, industrial park management to oversee this and manage these processes. And for us to be able to leverage our own membership to bring in some of the, some of the other initiatives, some of the other brands, finance, in order to strengthen that reward, that, that pull factor. Um, to Peru now, with a Swiss-funded project looking at Asparagus. I don't think asparagus is particularly well or widely used in Pakistan as it's a uh, popular uh, high value export crop in Peru. And that's what it looks like in its cultivation. This is the, the uh, sort of aerial shot of the desert uh, area between the Andes and the Pacific Ocean. And this here is a relatively new asparagus farm. 
And the reason why there's so much investment in these high value export crops in this environment is because the conditions are ideal. It doesn't get very hot, year round sunshine, and then what's the other thing you need? Um, oh, yeah, water, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, no one really thought too much about that when they were looking at these investments. Um, and they're running into some, some trouble having invested you know, billions of dollars in the agro-export sector. Um, this, is, this is cultivation of, of asparagus. You can see here some of the numbers, how much asparagus is exported, what the water impacts of that are, how quickly the groundwater is depleting. Um, some of it's quite scary, uh, but this is the idea of water stewardship isn't to say, well, you shouldn't be doing the, this asparagus production here, or mangoes, or blueberries, or whatever else they're producing, but rather, let's learn to actually do this sustainably. And similarly, there's a, with the, the Chinese uh, example here, but more explicitly in terms of policy, we have the the push factor of, of actually doing tangible things on the ground, implementing our standard on the ground to improve how water is used in this context. Here you can see the drip irrigation as an example of some of those interventions. The pull factor comes from the retailers that were engaged in this project. This is the Swiss retailer co-op. Uh, Marks and Spencer is the well-known UK retailer was also part of this uh, project. And the third piece is policy. Well, you can imagine how many livelihoods are dependent on, on an industry which, is, which, is, which produces and exports, transports, packages, and exports the kind of numbers uh, that, that I showed in my previous slide. And that's just asparagus. You know, the same farms will produce mangoes and blueberries and and, and a variety of uh, uh, avocados and a variety of other crops. And so there's a clear uh, incentive here for the, for the public sector to get engaged. And that's where we've been setting up, um, uh, again, a local platform, not dissimilar to the Pakistan Water Stewardship Network, um, but also linking to an existing government uh, certification scheme for industry. Uh, it's called the, um, the Blue Certificate Scheme so that that can be used as a pathway for implementation of the AWS standard. And after a, a relatively short period of time, we've, we've achieved, uh, I think, quite a lot. The, the scene is set, so to speak, for much deeper in, uh, engagement in Peru. And, it, it, and like, like Pakistan, it's a country which I feel is really on the cusp of, 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 of uh, and I, uh, this might sound a bit corny, but of, of genuine global leadership in water stewardship. Uh, you know, the, the, the energy and the enthusiasm behind water stewardship in Pakistan or in Peru uh, is, is, is really uh, inspirational. Um, I'm not sure it's something to every country that begins with the letter P. Maybe that's it. Could be. Scotland doesn't begin with the letter P. Uh, this is my this is my home. Now, clearly, we have a whole different set of challenges, uh, most of which come from south of the border. Uh, so, pretend I didn't say that. Um, this is our our renowned national health service. <clears throat> they might not. What's the, what's the connection between asparagus in Peru and, and the national health service? Well, the national health service. This is a small hospital in. Uh, in the north of Scotland, which is aiming to become the first healthcare facility in the world to achieve AWS certification. Well, why is that? Well, the health service employs a lot of these uh, who like to prescribe a lot of these pharmaceuticals. And that results in a lot of this spiraling costs. But those costs are not just financial costs. Those costs are also the costs related to the environment and awareness of, of contamination, uh, water quality issues related to pharmaceuticals is rising more and more. And it's one of these things, the more you know about it, the scarier it gets. So I, I until this, I was completely uh, ignorant of the, the issues as well. But it, logically, one of the things, when I take a tablet and swallow it, and that's, it's done its job, it's cured my headache or whatever, done. 
that's not the case. Up to 90% of the active ingredients enter the environment and cause huge amounts of damage to the environment, in particular in the aquatic species. Uh, and so this is where the health service is looking at actual costs of pharmaceutical uh, use, future costs of having, trying to keep people out of hospital, uh, keep people healthier, having a healthier environment, and seeing that water stewardship can really be a, a key part of that sustainability strategy. And from my perspective, I'm delighted because it's, you know, it's, uh, I, I've got something to say about my home country as well, but I'm delighted because it's setting an example that if you can do something like this in the, in the north of Scotland, you can do it in Karachi as well. You can do it in Manila or in Rio de Janeiro or anywhere else in the world and really start to get people behind this. And so it's that global leadership that I was mentioning before is so important in initiatives like water stewardship because we need, we need people to inspire and motivate us. And, and these examples I've pointed out today are, are some of the ones which, uh, which certainly do that for me. And so just to, just to conclude, um, I, think that, I think it's pretty clear there's, there's a, there are a lot of benefits from water stewardship, both from the public and the private perspectives. Um, there's a lot of uh, potential to, to enable it to coordinate uh, different policy initiatives, bring different things into one place, whether that's a, you know, agriculture and, and, and energy and water, uh, community, uh, access to services, whatever it might be, there's a great opportunity for this to be a framework to bring different policy initiatives together. But in the long term, we really need to be able to demonstrate that water stewardship can uh, make genuine contributions to systemic change. Um, if we can't do that, it's really probably not worth, not worth doing. But I hope you've understood that I certainly fir firmly believe we're on track to be able to do that. But to do so, it's really not about the water. It's about the people. It's the people who make the difference. When I listen to water stewardship dialogues in different parts around the world, it's ultimately about who can do what or how are we going to get them to do this or them to talk to them or them to develop such and such a policy. It's actually very little to do with the water. Yes, we need a, the understanding of the hydrological situation, but it's, it's a, ultimately a political issue rather than a hydrological issue. Thank you very much.